everyone. Welcome to uh, System Thinking Ontario for November, um, or this could be considered a rerun of RSD conference or expanded or, uh, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, we actually had not uh, formally scheduled. We're actually getting more agile about scheduling the sessions. And so uh, when we had the RSD meeting and uh, Peter was presenting and got a lot of interest and, and Ryan was present presenting as well, it's kind of like, well, we're getting so much interest that we should actually provide a little more time for them to unpack the content. And so um, that is the reason that we have the session on redesigning our theory of theories of theories of change today. Uh, what we'll do is we'll go around and I'll um, ask people to unmute and uh, introduce themselves. The usual question we ask is your name and how did you come to systems or this group or whatever you'd like to talk about briefly. We have a lot of people on, so if you could be very brief. Um, and then I'm essentially going to just turn it over to Peter and between Peter and Ryan, they'll manage the whole time that's left. Um, they'll give some time to, for the talk. Uh, then we may pause for questions and we'll see how the crowd goes. And as always, we're recording. So if you uh, don't want to be seen, um, you can turn your camera off and uh, you can speak with your camera off. Uh, people will be hard to identify you from your voice, but um, that's how it goes. So I'm just going to uh, go around and uh, ask people to introduce themselves. And so uh, our host is actually uh, on the Zoom call is actually Dan Ng. Dan, do you want to say hi? Hi. Want me to do the other piece? The obligatory, oh, yes, please. Yes, I, um, I came to systems thinking from knowing, I think, David for 20 some odd years. I think I've got the math right. So He was talking about a lot earlier and I didn't understand and I'm understanding more from Thanks. Toronto. Thanks. Nishat. Uh, hi, yes. Hi. Uh, so I, I mostly came to systems uh, with my acquaintance with David Ng and David Hawk uh, some 10 years ago. So they led me to read the major works by Russell Acoff or West Churchman. And David Ng has been kind enough to guide me to this group here since I landed in Canada last year. Thanks, Nishat. Joanne, did you say uh, hello and where are you coming from? Uh, yes, this is Joanne. I joined the group uh, just a few months ago through David and uh, being a practitioner of uh, complexity thinking for a number of years. So I'm really happy uh, to meet uh, a group of uh, academics and uh, practitioners like me. So thank you, David. Thanks, Joanne. Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly Okamura. I've been coming for a long while and uh, I came to systems thinking through design with dialogue and design thinking. Thanks, Kelly. Curtis. Hi, Curtis McCord at the University of Toronto. I came to systems thinking, uh, I don't know really how to answer that from reading a bunch of philosophy and then getting into soft and critical systems thinking. Great, thanks. Yananda? Hi, um, actually, this is my first time in this group here today. And um, Peter was my professor during my SFI program. He was a systems thinking professor. And he was also my supervisor, which I also used systems thinking for my, my MRP. So I was very interesting, interested on what they have to say today. Good, thanks. Alana. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm a strategic foresight grad along with Jananda. Hi. Uh, and I'm now uh, a KPMG consultant where I focus on humanizing complexity, uh, working very hard at that uh, on very practical applications of systems thinking and looking forward to uh, a little bit of uh, forward thinking theory tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Nelia. Hello, uh, I am a former student of uh, 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 in the SFI program. Um, I uh, just wanted to come and check out uh, some of the presentations tonight. 
Great, thanks. See you more. Hi there, I'm a doctoral student at uh, Fielding Graduate University and uh, got here through David and I thank you for that. Thanks. Katie, good to see you, Katie. Hi, I'm Katie Kish. I'm doing my postdoc at McGill and uh, I met David eight or nine years ago when I was doing my master's at York. Uh, and I think he was kind of just founding this group at the time. Thanks. Aleem. Hi, uh, my name is Aleem. Uh, my background, I'm a job <clears throat> lean coach. And uh, so naturally I came from uh, Agile background uh, through David. It's almost a uh, year now I'm attending those uh, uh, SD sessions. Thanks, David. Great, thanks. Dre? Uh, hi, I'm Dre. I'm just some random uh, guy that uh, found a link uh, and I've been dipping my toe in uh, systems thinking, fell down the uh, ACOF rabbit hole on, on YouTube. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be here and see what you guys are doing. Thanks. Katarina. Hi, um, been with this group probably for two years, possibly longer, I don't actually know how long and came to systems thinking more by accident probably about 20 years ago. And I'm just exposing myself more and more to the theory of it now. Daisy? Hi, um, i from Toronto and I came to this group last year uh, when uh, it was at OGAD. Um, I'm just really uh, glad that uh, David has, uh, David and Peter have group um just as an outsider just it's a great opportunity to learn more about this thinking thanks thanks daisy irene hi my name's irene um i'm based in toronto as well um i've been to one of these meetings before i come from the design world and um so i'm just interested to uh, hear more about the presentations today and um become more engaged Thanks. Zad. Hi, I'm Zad. I'm calling in from Toronto. Um, I'm a graduate of the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program. So I came to Systems Thinking through Peter Jones, who was an instructor in the program, and I met David Ng through that as well. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Kareem? Oh, got to get off mute. Hey everyone, uh, Karim from Toronto. Just tumbled onto this group. It's my first meeting here. I've been a facilitator, an educator on theories of change, actually, primarily, and, and a little bit on system thinking. So, here to learn. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Rose. Hi, I'm Rose Kudlak. Um, I found the group maybe four or five years ago via an exploration of uh, circular economy, and I've been Kind of dipping in ever since. Thanks. Robert? Hi, my name is Robert. I'm calling from the Markham, Ontario area. I, I think discovered systems thinking just through my personal curiosity and self-directed learning and found systems thinking Ontario after meeting David Ng at a peer-to-peer uh, -peer technology and decentralized web meetup in Toronto uh, a couple years ago. Thanks. Don? Oh, hi. Okay, I've been a, kind of a friend of this group for, I guess, several years and always been interested in, in seeing um, what, what uh, new theories people can, can dig up and, and post online. I think it takes a lot of courage to do that, considering nobody knows what's actually happening. <laughs> Thanks. Akeem Behan. Yeah, good, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kenny. Um, I'm a postgraduate student, so I was trying, trying to use a system thinking, system dynamics uh, for my dissertation. So um, I actually found this uh, link online, and I'm here again to learn from you guys. Thanks. Thanks. Brett? Hi, I'm a social entrepreneur from Toronto. I have a complex problem, and Rose Kudlak actually suggested to me that I uh, attend this today. Uh, it's become obvious that this problem needs a good dose of, of systems thinking to solve. Thanks. Someone who signed in as the Law and Design Collab. 
Oh, hi. <clears throat> Can you hear me? My name's, hello? Yeah. Oh, hey, my name's Avery. Um, I uh, work, I run a nonprofit group called the Law Design Collab. I've just added a link here in the, in the group chat. We're working on systemic change and we're writing a theory of change this week. So uh, that's why <laughs> I called in. I hope you're not expecting an answer within the week, but uh, that'll be <laughs> high expectations for Peter and Ryan. Uh, Tim. Yeah, so I'm, um, I guess, an ecologist turned lawyer, and I uh, spent an awful lot of time dealing with uh, systems theorists in my uh, some graduate work. It's been some time since I've dipped my toe into anything academic, and I came across this uh, link, so I want to see what's going on in this world. Great. Peter? Okay. No. This not, is, not, is me or Peter Jones? No, just Peter, not Peter Jones yet. We're not there Stoico. yet. Stoico, hey. Okay, hey. Yes, I'm Peter Stoico. Um, so I, I have a private consultancy. I've been do, doing system thinking work since the 90s in some capacity or another. Um, and I have um, an initiative called SystemViz, which is at systemviz.com about visualizing systems theory. Thanks. Melissa? Hi, I'm Melissa Tulio. Um, I'm in Toronto, and um, and my background is I'm a graduate of MDES, so that's how I know this group and have been in touch with this group. Great, thanks, Elena. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Elena Leonard. I've been in this group, I guess, since the start, and am enjoying the whole development of systems thinking in Ontario. And I've been also floating around the cybernetics community. Um, okay, thanks. Tim Lloyd. Hey, hey there, everybody. Uh, um, good to see everybody. I, I, I used to help organize this with David uh, way back when, so nice to see lots of uh, folks I haven't seen in a long time. Um, yeah, interested in systems thinking and all sorts of stuff around that. Thanks. Ken? Um, I'm coming in, I guess, from TameFlow at this point. Um. Okay. Um, and I'm going to turn it over. Maybe, maybe I should have Ryan introduce Peter and Peter introduce Ryan, which will be an interesting way of getting into this. So um, why, don't you, why don't you do that and I'll step out. That's kind of evil. No preparation. Um, okay, I can I can take a shot. I do have a logistics point that I was going to make in my introduction, which is that uh, I'm actually we're expecting our first kid in uh, about five weeks, and so I'll have to run exactly at the end of this session, and we'll be able to stay sadly because uh, we've got a session, a training session on on how babies work uh, immediately after this. So I'll be zooming for the next three or four hours. Um, but as for Peter, Peter, uh, Peter Jones is a faculty member at the uh, at OCAD University. Um, and I met Peter um, when I also became a student uh, at the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program at OCAD. Um, Peter taught some of our systems courses. And then since then, um, Peter and I just keep coming back and forth on, on how systems work and how to work with systems. Uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about today is the latest evolution on, on this. Um, one of the funniest things about this topic to me is that uh, all, while Peter and I have been trading papers back and forth, this attack on theories of change happened completely serendipitously. Um, Peter, uh, uh, I emailed Peter uh, just a few months before um, RSD and said, hey, what about this topic? And he and I had been writing about it a little bit on my own. Um, and then uh, Peter was like, oh, actually, I've got a talk already submitted. So uh, it is just the time, I think, to, to argue with this. That's what happens uh, when the field evolves. Multiple people start to attack the same thing at the same time. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have, I don't think I have anything else to add on a prelude. Pass it on to you, Peter. Thanks, Ryan. Hi, everybody. It's uh, it it's, it's fantastic to see such a good uh, crowd turn out uh, online on, on a Monday evening and, uh, and as a follow up to um, the presentations that, that uh, Ryan and I gave at RSD9 just, uh, just three weeks ago. Uh, the, you know, I think the compelling reason for having this talk was that 
there were there were actually people at RSD that um, that suggested that we weren't able to get into enough actually detail from from uh, an emerging topic that was um, that had quite a bit of interest. Um, I mean that was that was the first thing, and then also you know there were there were people that had actually asked. Uh, Ryan directly that we're at RSD wanted to hear more about it. So we're going to have more time and presentation uh, than we would normally have. Um, and so um, I will, um, so I'll take it from here. And then um, Ryan, you kind of introduced yourself, but I'll say, I'll, I'll introduce you when it's time to get your talk. So I'll, what I'll do is, is go for about 25 minutes, 30 minutes. And then ask for some. Then ask for a few questions on mine. We'll have Ryan's for about half an hour as well, and um, yeah, and then take questions across both if that if that works. Okay. So I, I hope everybody can see um, the sketch note. Um, Patricia Kamich is a sketch note from RSD nine. This actually gives away the whole story. Um, but this will make more sense to you after the talk than probably right now, which is it's so compressed that it's more of a of a an, of a an index into everything that that um, that the talk covers. And so this area was so kind of, a, expl, you know, explosive in a sense for Ryan and I in the, um, in that we had a, a lot more to say that had developed during 2020 then we could really fit into even the conference. I gave two talks at RSD. And so what I've done here is, is combine them into one, which I hope is uh, really sufficient for that. Um, so, so I want to discuss the a systemic design approach to theories of change coming from an inquiry that, um, that uh, I've been developing uh, on my own through working with uh, many different change programs and proposals for the most part, where a specific theory of change, that is the proposed enactment of, of a change program is being presented in a proposal or to funders, or even is developed among team members. And so I've, I've, I've noticed that, you know, we call these theories of change as a term of art, when it's really usually a, a model, a mental model or a constructed model, a socially constructed model that represents, in a sense, our working theory of action. They're very often process models about action that sort of magically result in, into impact or change as, as outcomes. And there are often gaps within these models that you know, I think we, we don't realize that we gloss over when we don't have a sufficient kind of systemic basis to you know for the for a theory of change process the other kind of driving issue that at least i was really interested in here is that uh, theories of change are often constructed with these uh, fairly traditional logic models and they they could be better designed so from a from a just from a design perspective i you know i'd strongly believe we can start to move different types of changed theories into into more into encompassing better uh, better systems theory and enhancing the the communicative design aspects so that visually and um, and the construction of meaning comes across a lot a lot more convincing and we can use them more effectively as as tools for change and so just a little bit more on on, on really on these bullets which is really about this opening slide is on really the, the very practical issues around why we need, why we work with theories of change for those that are working with them. I mean, so social change programs uh, or the social sector often funded by winning proposals that, that actually kind of demand um, a representation of your change strategy, which we often call, it's known as a theory of change going back for, you know, for, for many years. It's a term of art. And now it's become kind of an embodiment, almost like a business model. And so proposals are won by con convincing the review teams that their funds are best, um, ex you know, are, are best invested in a particular theory of, of outcome that can be supported by the logic uh, that can be represented in a theory of change logic model and in the narratives that support it. And 
and one of the reasons it's important, I think, to have a, a good visual design is that the channel capacity for for a review teams uh, for, for any proposal is going to be fairly limited. They're going to like to see a concise, um, a well-constructed image that matches their understanding of what an effective change strategy might be. But in doing so, I mean, I, I think that we're able to, we're going to encounter very often this, this kind of looping effect, which uh, a problematic looping effect, which is that in order to communicate effectively to, to donors, funders, and program evaluation, we often re overly reduce and um, under conceptualize the, the complexity of, you know, of, of, of what we know the reality of a change program is going to be. And therefore we start to believe that you know, as we create our own loop in, 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 the, in the presentation of, of a more constrained or reduced theory of change that becomes uh, if you will, you know, shorthand for our strategy. But if we do that, that also might reduce the um, our understanding of of the of the very real complexity that we'll be dealing with. And so, um, and so, and so we have, uh, you know, we're often dealing with this, you know, a conversational loop where, you know, we have to adjust the theory of change to to the appropriate context uh, with funders. So, so what do we promise when we use or say that? You know that the theory of change is is, is valid for for a type of change strategy. So there are arguments for systems change, and any more of the, the I guess theories of change were um, have actually been freighted with the increasing um, demands of philanthropy as as philanthropy and and um, and change programs have moved from perhaps the 80s and 90s to organizational. And, it, um, and regional and you know, kind of municipal or community change programs to um, impact investing, to, um, to systems change, and now to transformational level systems change. We're, we're still using the same types of theories of change and the same language, but the demands from funders have become surreal in some ways. I mean, they're asking us to, to tell them how they can they can meet their goals of funding real real significant systems change and and in my understanding of a lot of the programs are out there there are very few that beat my standards there are a lot of program of developmental evaluation localized change programs but for kind of the large scale that's being asked for a lot of time it's very difficult to you know to uh, guarantee or should say it's a it's an intellectual, um, you know, we're, we risk some intellectual fraud to guarantee the level of system change that is being requested at, at kind of the level of urgency and scale that we sometimes hear or see. But nonetheless, we're, we do our best in developing, uh, identifying, I guess, the best approaches to a change strategy and developing frameworks, strategies for what would be appropriate actions to lead to change, alignment with uh, the funding organization and and planning that so the tasks can fall out of the logic of the, of the change model, um, developing then from their criteria and structures that can be used to evaluate the effectiveness of uh, the program. So for so the change model uh, theory of change is also then used for program evaluation, um, especially of course if it's a if it's a developmental evaluation type of project. Uh, they create causal pathways so that we can plan different options or strategies that might follow um, potential branching points or different parallel streams of, of action for impact. And then kind of a final point on this is that um, they aren't really causal or theoretical theories. These are working theories. They say theory of change, it's essentially what a question about what is your what is your working mental model that that your team believes in that you're going to advance as a, as a strategy that that we are going to plan to so therefore these are a big deal for for change makers and practitioners in fact you actually 
this is an area that's developed. So if you search on, on theories of change, this is a typical search results of the images you might see. And you might, uh, and in a lot, and, and a number of these come from very notable, well-developed websites, theoryofchange.org and evaluation practice. Uh, they're, they're venerable, very well-developed, well understood in, in their field. Uh, but I'd have to say one of the weaknesses is that in, in um, system sciences, we don't really have a literature or a strong basis for, for advising theories of change. And so that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons I've taken some interest in this and, and Ryan is taking interest from, from uh, his work in leverage analysis as an approach to theory of change. So when you look at those, those typical logic models, what do you notice? They are, um, they, they look actually kind of linear. They're complicated, not complex. That is, they have a number of steps. You can follow the steps that leads to this kind of um, garden path effect that if we follow these steps in a complicated process, there's the poss there's the high likelihood, some probability that in, you know, there'll be a future impact that is represented out of, out of out of the faithful accomplishment, a task associated with, a, with that logic. The flows are largely linear, making it look more overly causal than we believe they might be. Um, you often see actions that are mapped across timeframes like you might see in, in a complicated Gantt chart or project management flow, but rather than like completion of the project, they build or lead to uh, like in this example to, you know, um, um, uh, training students and, and young people and through entrepreneurial culture into enabling entrepreneurship. So this is, there is actually a lot of complexity inherent in something like this change story, uh, this visual story for how, how that might occur. Um, however, the, the story, the complexity is, is really hidden by the a kind of canonical theory of change approach to just, you know, build up, build out a, a series of text flows, if you will, that 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 illustrate a simplified logic. The causal pathways that are that are implied in these flows are not really apparent. That is, what leads to what, what actions lead to what outcomes lead to what impacts. Now, a good logic model does usually show that, but we often see these very simplified um, explanations. Um, for that, um, and so the so the, some of the theories then my uh, of of theories of change ought to be theories of systems change to some extent, not necessarily all large scale systems, but the appropriate unit of analysis. And uh, so the the models that we use to represent a theory of change, the visual models, um, ought to some extent really reflect the world that we're speaking to. So um, maybe it, you know, we're, we're continuing to use these models like those on the left, the logic model um, kind of, this one looks like actually a hierarchical org chart, but it's read, you know, um, um, up to the outcomes at the top, as opposed to top down from the CEO defining tasks or whatever, you know, so, so they're read according to their own internal logic, if you will, but uh, there, so there is a type of visual theory, if you will, that, that doesn't reflect the complexity of actual system change, um, system impact, I think so. Um, and so one of the points I made before, and I reflect that here is that, um, that theories of change are, are required kind of to the same extent as a business model for an entrepreneurial um, startup is is requested by um, a venture capitalist to show, you know, what is your theory for how the business is going to make, you know, become sustainably self-funded and be able to pay back, you know, the the, the VC loans, since because uh, philanthropists don't expect um, financial payoff, but but a type of impact or a change program that leads to, you know, shared values, they're looking for. Um, a different type of model, but they, but perhaps they're this being, for example, the flourishing business canvas. That's that's uh, a type of 
of logic model that could actually be used as a theory of change. If there is a theory of change inherent in that type of social, ecological, financial business model, but we wouldn't normally use that with a, with a philanthropist. And so there are some problems or issues with theories of change in practice that I think is designer, um, design and systems thinkers we can address differently. And of course, this is from a systemic design where we're integrating systems theory and, uh, and then we're using systems theory as a theoretical basis for um, larger scale system design and change. You know, this is should become, you know, opening up an important area for us. And so there, are, so we want to look at the problems and areas that we should be addressing. Um, um, so, I mean, there are, and so if the, if the logic models are oversimplified to the point of, I uh, said, maybe intellectual fraud is, is, is too much, but misdirection, that is um, where we start to create us stories that are perhaps too simplistic. And then as we actually perform, you know, the uh, perform according to our proposals, we update those models as we go. But if we get into a looping effect, we may actually have reduced the expectations for addressing complexity by our own, by our own conversations around our own adaptation to that mental, mental model, kind of a ceiling effect. And, and because we have a limited space and ability to, to conceptualize uh, stories of change anyway, they're necessarily incomplete and they're vague. Um, that is, we don't know how they're incomplete. We know that they are though. It's because we, it would be unknowable to understand all of the potential uh, out, um, outcomes that might be important to some stakeholders or to, in fact, we wouldn't know it if our proposal was rejected, whether we were actually incomplete with respect to values of the funder. We'll tend to know that we're alignment when we're, when we're actually winning, when we win a proposal. And very often these models then can be optimistic, overly optimistic. They're what I would call a just so story. We've created kind of an optimal, optimistic, overly optimized uh, engineered view of the future uh, inherently just because we have to create a model that can communicate. And, we, and, this, and this happens in other types of systems analysis, I think as well. Although when we're more analytic in systems analysis, the decomposition approach tends to be more complete, but you wouldn't do that in a proposal, right? It's gonna be a lot of work, a lot of analysis, but instead this is kind of a synthesis of the future. It's a storytelling approach. And so we need, to, you know, I think we need to improve the underlying theory and to find more creative ways to present the complexity without overwhelming um, uh, the reader. Um, and, and, and so there's some other problems that I think are, you know, probably not so important to, you know, to this audience, but if you have questions about this or if you've identified other problems in practice, I think, I think they really are of interest. Is, I mean, one of these, the next to bottom bullet is the ability to evaluate the fitness of a theory of change is going to be too late to change the theory of change. So by the time we know that it really we've learned from the field and from our, you know, from, um, you know, from you know, we're halfway through the program, um, we're not going to be able to step out of the the project to be able to really evaluate it. So we're going to do some incremental evaluation along the way. Even then, what we're evaluating are actions, but not eventual outcomes. We can start to see those, but you know, there you have this. Um, if you start to change your theory, change in in process, you know, that could also be you know problematic. So the, um, just to summarize, um, uh, well, this part and to show a couple of examples and see theories that changes logic models to make case for change of change over time. And I, I, I showed, you know, briefly, but didn't mention anything about it, the crossing the chasm model, which is the one on the right from, from uh, Jeffrey Moore on the left, uh, one that typically seen and actually this one looks like the chaotic steps or other type of right. just it's shown as a as, as an unfolding curve, I think, just for uh, to, to represent that it might be more cyclic, even if cycles aren't necessarily inherent in, in this process. And in, in the Nesta model on the left, the seven stages for 
for innovation, for social innovation, and one that's that is kind of venerable that has been around since I think 1999. Um, uh, Meg Wheatley and, and Deborah Fries's um, emergence of new systems that replace um, uh, systems that are in, in stages of collapse, and so this kind of two-stage model. So I also want to give a word about system change literacy and systems changes program that uh, David Ng, Robert Best, Zad Khan, uh, Kelly Okimura. So actually, I guess kind of the whole team is on the call probably uh, that has, um, you know, and, and I've been, you know, a fellow traveler with um, David's research agenda uh, that with a, with a um, with a team that's been working in social innovation contexts on developing uh, kind of some of the best new work and raising the systems theory up that we should be using in, in really thinking um, systemically about, about how change actually happens. And so some core questions here, which we don't often answer in the logic model of theory of change are things like which system it's just assumed that like a, there is a system of homelessness that we will be addressing. Now that can then become extremely interconnected and involving, you know, um, you know, not just housing policy, but you know, zoning and development policy and governance and the uh, histories of populations. So any the uh, the question of which system is so important and. In a proposal, we often don't get to change the framing of the system because it would mean that we were suggesting to the funder that we're actually interested in, in a different angle of that system, and they may they may think we don't understand. Um, and so, who participates in that system? Who decides what counts as change? And, you know, these are simple but powerful questions. Um, what changes count as change? And so when does impact start to happen? Um, could it actually be earlier and in, in forms that we didn't measure? Do we, are we able to ac account for that? Do our observations account for how changes occur? Also, who is, who is responsible for making change happen and for observing it, for registering it? And, and then one of the questions, this is from, from my RSD talk. And you know, I did want to kind of pose to, the, to everybody there and said, you know, did you happen as designers in particular, did you happen to notice that your that systems theory changed? That we have not that, um, not that the, uh, you know, Singarian inquiring systems and, and churchmen's approach or that, you know, Ozbekan, Eric Yonch's social systems and um, uh, moving into Russell Acoff's era of the 80s, Peter Senge, Horse riddles, wicked problems. These haven't gone away, but there's an there, there's an entirely new, you know, kind of field of systems theories that are very oriented towards dynamic change. Um, Holon's hierarchy theory, eco resilience, and, and eco um, systems ecology, uh, ecological anthropology, second order cybernetics, um, and so this has been, you know, uh, something of a soft movement that we need to pay attention to that I think would be that that we can incorporate into the logic models of the future, if you will. And so this is important to consider when you see what funders and foundations philanthropists are actually doing. And so these are recent representations like the Stanford so Social Innovation Review with special issues on systems change. The, the McConnell Foundation has very prominent featuring of systems change in their literature and their approach in their website. Um, in the Alliance uh, magazine for philanthropy, uh, a recent issue on systems change in philanthropy from, our, from, from last year, um, uh, you know, collection of new tools. A lot of this has come about really just in the last three years. I mean, we, they, um, philanthropy had moved <laughs> moved um, bless you, uh, into impact events, impacted investing pretty notably, oh, starting 10 years ago or so, and then started shifting into, um, you know, the, imp the real kind of, you know, uh, 
asking why we couldn't have strategic impacts from impact investing. Where is the societal level change? Can we have system level change? And so there, are, uh, there have been recent um, presentations of this, and I mean really recent, from uh, 2018. There was uh, on the right, you see, uh, um, mm. this is somewhat circulating around, which is a summary of a document from a retreat in Wasan, you know, one of these kind of island retreats over the summer that uh, Praveen Nahar from National Institute of Design and, and I were invited to with a number of foundation, many of foundation advisors and, you know, representing, representing kind of the way foundations might approach their new um, uh, frameworks and requests and, and their RFP structures and, and some leading kind of exchange people. And so uh, these were, they developed, um, um, you know, some guidelines for, which were actually quite broad for, for, for how did, how we might evolve and consider um, systems change, what, what it, what it is to, to us as a developing community, as practitioners, and, and then, uh, you know, with uh, design, strategic foresight, and um, and systems thinking, we've been we're, we're pretty major co contributors to this. But at the same time, if we go back many years, a number of years, you know, there's a strong basis in social science for theories of change. There are strategies for social system interventions that go back to uh, Kurt Levine, um, you know, organizational change theory, and so they were like I've. I've indicated before, even if we have fairly simple logic models, the, uh, like the one on the left, which is a, a real one for from theoryofchange.org, from a, a project for, um, uh, you know, from a, a typical kind of pro, um, a social change pro, um, investment program. And they can then lead to outcomes that could be represented by the success in measuring um, outcomes that were determined from those logic models to be, to be, um, you know, directly associated from the change. So this means you have to match your unit of analysis very carefully. Um, that is what you're going to measure for that change. And so a, a drop in Seattle's uh, homeless youth for having an, an, an annual count, but you would also want to su support those numbers with, uh, you know, population level statistics down to the different different regions to just see that people didn't just move around in the city and that you had surveys to inquire qualitative to inquire through qualitative research to understand what what the background dynamics were so just to touch on what some of the classic models that support theory of change in social sciences this is peter drucker on the right by the way who's who also okay you know, has some basis in this, but going back to Kurt Levine's organizational field theory, 1947, classical management theory that has been referencing, you know, all the organizational development literature supporting Levine since then. And I think probably the biggest change was in new management theory that was taking into account complexity and chaos and, and the enact and now enactment in the last 10 years or so that has come uh, that Meg Wheatley and, and others coming from a cybernetics perspective, were advancing in the 1990s. Uh, around the same time, but really advancing really over the last 20 years in complex program evaluation, going from developmental evaluation, which is really well developed by Michael Quinn Patton, um, who's at the Union Institute when I was there with my PhD in the late 90s, and is now you know advising everybody and doing workshops, and some of you may have taken workshops with him, as well as Francis Wesley and, and others that he's partnered with and, and, and written with in various books, his recent work on principle focused evaluation really takes into account evaluation within complexity. And then, uh, and then the developing literature and in social innovation, which really does take this into account. And so how some of these models look in, order to, in, in uh, Levine's uh, field theory is essentially a, uh, takes into account uh, quite a bit of complexity but it's often thought of in very simple terms because it is expressed in really a three-stage model of within an organization or a unit of social structure. There is uh, uh, that as, um, as researchers, as action researchers, we would create, a, create conditions for unfreezing from 
from fixed norms and processes in starting to, intro to create um, the conditions and the awareness for introducing new processes through training or adaptation through prototypes. And there's a cycle for that unfreezing until there's kind of a sense that there's readiness. There's a moving, or this is often called the intervention, but Levine really called it moving. These were verbs, unfreezing, moving, refreezing. And so the moving process was, was the moving an organization into new frames and into, into we would we'd consider the introduction of prototypes if we were doing design action research here. And from that moving process, we can identify the, the adoption, the adaptation, and then start to refreeze or to, as to, to, to um, institutionalize what's been learned from, from, from that adoption. Uh, and actually, a not uh, when you think about it, um, um, Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm is not so different in terms of, of, of a change process that requires a moving and then an adaptation. But it's shown in kind of a step in a in a step change uh, theory. This Crossing the Chasm is the idea that almost any innovation, you know, social innovation as well, can be introduced to you know, within certain market with to the markets of early adopters, but if it doesn't grow beyond that, it's not going to have the affected impact. Or in business terms, it isn't going to grow the market and make and make uh, you know turn the, you know turn, make make the venture capitalists wealthy. So the the crossing the chasm is 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 a lot more complex than this would look. That is the the way of moving through that chasm is a process of moving. There is a a tight, sometimes called disruption, the unfreezing effects of the early adopters do not just grow through market change or market access to early majority across the chasm. The early majority has to have, they tend to be more conservative. They may be, they might like the situation, you know, what the, the, the kind of the processes they're working with. Think about how difficult it is to change educational practices. And so, you know, there have been many attempts made and you can't just push technology to move across the chasm. And so this is in itself a theory of change that can also be integrated into others. The large scale system change I'd mentioned, the uh, Meg Wheatley freezes, um, that's called the Burkana Institute and it's often called two loops. And within the two loops, the, the loop at the top or the curve of the system that might be in, in a first horizon kind of context is seen as declining from its fitness to, you know, fitness to the future, certainly, but even fitness to current purpose. And so there's a change in strategy with the, 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 the management of, of that system from stewarding its, its you know, con a conservation approach to a hospicing, as they have, have said, and this term is often used to represent the, the, the kind of letting that system down easy as if it's in um, that as it as if it's in the collapse state from a panarchy and it's resolving into you know the omega distribution of of capitals which which is almost shown here that then you want to actually be raising the next system from long before from introducing it at the same time that you're working with the system and if this is a three horizons model which is very similar to this the two loops would actually be um, overlapped as kind of hills that succeed each other but here is as one system dies the other you know picks picks up and then you raise and nourish and illuminate you know this is this is more of a living system approach it's more it's more nurturing in its in its orientation to something like crossing the chasm which might be might almost see that as as kind of hyper masculine and quite feminine even in their orientations um, that's often come up in discussions around the selection of the theory of change and so uh, and some of the people that I'm working with are actually represented and I'm working with now in this project called Bounce Beyond are represented in in the picture to the right that comes out of Steve Waddell Sandra Waddock's um, work in large systems change and this goes back five years now, but you know, they're, they've gone from the framing of LSC to now transformations systems. So very much like systems changes in the plural, um, uh, Waddock, and Waddock and Waddell 
and and many of us they actually have what's called the SDG Transformations Forum. So multiple transformations to achieve SDG trans uh, SDG outcomes over you know the ten year strategy, and so this just gives you an idea of another approach to a logic model or to a theory of change, which has actually changed quite a bit in those five years. But some of the questions that we have would still be the same questions in terms of our, you know, was this sufficient for the time? It was probably the best we had at the time, perhaps, um, but we have the same types of challenges. So that is, are we really, is the goal theory of change to represent the outcomes of, that are, that are measurable from a particular proposed process? Um, is, I mean, is that in essence what is being proposed that we, we guarantee, we believe the model guarantees certain level of change that we can measure at, at an endpoint and, and, and demonstrate, but isn't real change highly complex and the changes of changes um, are a process that we might not have the time to manage if we're just coming in for a two-year program. And do we have the ability to um, <clears throat> to foster and 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 continue to intervene and to register the types of, the types of changes that are that are interventions um, instantiate within within this within the social systems uh, of engagement. And so, do we do we have a way to represent emergence? Not really, not very well. Can we validate theories of change? Can we say that at the end? of a project, our theory of change was accurate or it was 90% accurate and where the gaps were. And how, how should we account for, you know, scales of change? What is, you know, large system versus, you know, uh, societal transformation. And so this transformation systems approach is something you consider. And, and so the, some of the ways that we're now seeing, like in McConnell again on the left shows in, in recent literature there is on their website, you'll see a picture of their approach to kind of capture this complexity. There are now many organizations that they're not funding them all, but there are many organizations that are moving in the same direction. And that these approaches sometimes called like by Dave, David Corton and Joanna Macy, the great transition and, or the great turning. And there's also the great transition, which is similar so the turning there's fourth turning as well but this is the great turning and and this kind of movement of movement approach which is that with many organizations moving the same direction a theory of change is that we we harness that momentum and there are also another way that i've seen just again recently is the forum for the future from systems shock to systems change where you see the implied flows from pathways to questions to hold to enabling approaches. This is probably more in line with, you know, with what we'd see in complexity. But I've, I've looked at a lot of these and taken, I don't have a, a full kind of documentation of them to show here in terms of, of them, but I've, I've um, modeled up, if you will, four sense-making logics that I find are pretty, are, are fairly common. I'd like to see whether there are others, but you could see these are um, action outcomes, uh, influence pathways, processes within complexity, and movement coordination. So I'll just go through these really quickly and let's take some questions and um, to wrap up here. But this is an important part. It's kind of the this is this is what's been developed that I think you know uh, out of out of you will the first stage of the research is that uh, these frameworks we can really say there are different approaches to theories of change that might be suitable for selection in different types of programs. So action outcome is very typical uh, that, you know, that we see in, in a lot of the um, kind of connected box logic of, of the classical theory, theory logic models, but also uh, the one that I'm showing here from, from our own work in the flourishing enterprise toolkit and flourishing business model, which is a theory of change that is staged from bottom up from individual change to system change, but is shown in a backcasting approach, even though the arrows are going up, they're going to the left instead of to the right to show that that it's in a sense nonlinear that these are different steps and cycles, even though it is even though these are actions with outcomes, it incorporates some degree of complexity. And so this is these an action outcome is to show 
actions which can be which are appropriate at the level of its step of its analysis so the, for going from developing tools to those tools used by individuals being used to influence their organizations being used across many organizations to influence systems change and so these are fairly simple steps they're not simplistic and believe that they, they you know they can be clearly defined and communicated they can be fairly linear here, yet still systemic. There are implied cycles that to keep the diagram from getting too uh, flourishing in the other meaning of that term, it's kept simple. And, and so the ultimate change goal is, is from the top left. And this also has you look, read from top left, what do we want and how do we will get there? So, and that's, that's the implications of the storytelling of that visual logic. Influence pathways are, um, are the result can you know are a technique for creating um, pathways for change happening through uh, multiple leverage points and connecting influence relations over um, um, a mix of linear and cyclic relationships that can be can create a, a much kind of messier diagram but perhaps truer to to um, planning in terms of of, I, of identifying in more granularity where where, um, where actions and influences might occur. Typically directed graphs, that is single single directed arrows from from uh, a node from one node to another node, indicating with with the change action on the arrow and the outcomes in the node, and can show influence networks and cycles and loops. That is, um, causal loop diagrams could be incorporated in influence pathways, which are, which are, which are a different type of formalism, but you can include them within a directed graph structure like these, or show them. They can be confusing if people, if your your if your uh, proposal is ex expecting more of a, a pathway type of diagram. These can be um, progressive abduction. That is. Um, which is a way of showing, um, um, you know, uh, it's a relational mapping style, but it's, I know you can't read this, but this is based, um, you could look at it closely, realize that all, all the, the directed um, graph lines, the flow lines are connecting um, action to outcome, well, at, uh, action really to um, immediate outcome, to strategic outcomes, to um, impacts and higher level impacts and so the different node types are indicated by their by their progressively increasing um, weight of, of impact that there would be and so the even though the the um, the arcs are not labeled here the way that it's read is that if we make progress on this action in the node um, will it have significant progress on the next on the next uh, action and on, and then we'll have progress toward these outcomes and impacts. And so those can be questioned and we can work back from them in a type of backcasting as well. If we start from the right and move back to the left, we can, um, we can assess through determining whether every kind of step needed, needed to actually happen. Are these steps fairly complete and you can get um, this is actually a high level diagram for the bounce beyond, which is, I think, perhaps best looked at as, um, as a sketch note. Then there's processes within complexity. And so these might be um, more visual diagrams. They can use simple formalisms, um, but they can also um, um, as well. Oh, well, wait, no, that's left over from the other side. They can use some simple formalisms, but they're showing the processes within those um, uh, complex fields um, as, as perhaps multiple processes. So this is Three Horizons um, strategic foresight model, which, um, which is one that we actually used in climate action planning. And it indicates, and it was developed collectively by a number of, number of um, participants that worked on different stages in small groups in different stages of the, of the Three Horizons, both on groups on horizon one, two, and three, and on the transitions between them and on very long-term as well. So these were integrated by the contribution of different levels of temporal reasoning and then integrated into 
a process flow um, in essence. So this is, we understand complexity into the future and there could be multiple, multiple models that demonstrate that. And so this is the sketch note I was, I was mentioning before uh, from the Bounce Beyond project where he had the logic model from the influence pathways, but the way that we actually talk about Bounce Beyond is more in this type of uh, you know, um, visual storytelling from a sketch note, which if you look at it closely, you'll see um, it actually has a theory of change with the kind the bounce itself is from is going beyond um, the, the taking up from the crash of the first horizon that is as, as our current systems are failing, we want to bounce toward the third horizon as far as possible rather than building back. You know, this is a argument against building back better or bouncing back. This was del deliberately bouncing well beyond into new economic arrangements. And so you see at the very far right, flourishing futures, which is a, uh, the, the ultimate strategic impact but the uh, theory of change models are built in as three horizons, the crossing the chasm and network development and movement, movement formation with the transformation projects on the, on the left. And movement coordination would be the last one. So the movement of movements or the creating of movements and even the transformation system is a type of movement coordination. The transformation system approach from um, the SDG forum um, so Vodak and Waddell, um, and, and in Bounce Beyond, this is kind of in the background, is that there are other partnerships that are working on transformation systems as developing the capacities for change rather than specific change. And so this is, this is um, a different type of model that shows how those movements might be coordinated. And it's fairly complex, and this one's actually been published recently. If you look up Steve Waddell, and Sandra Waddick and, and, and their work over the last five years who get an idea of what's being worked on uh, or of how they've progressed in thinking over the last five years and this being perhaps the most recent. And so the movement supports the desired direction of ultimate transformation that is, that is, that is represented as, as a value by perhaps many of the movement groups. And then uh, just to complete, uh, show you a few di um, systemic design tools and models that also can be used to address some of the key questions. Um, so, and these are really important questions when we actually are defining what uh, tools or logic models to work with. So what's the unit of change? What's the unit of analysis? Um, we, we teach and often use this iterative inquiry or a cycle of, of, of kind of going from the, the, the closest um, loop that defines um, a very localized or granular unit of analysis, such as individual change in the closed loop to um, map out um, the function structure process and context for each, um, for each loop or each cycle in, in what's called an iterative inquiry. This is from Jamshid Garajadagi and comes out of the ACOF school of social systems design, if you will. And so this is the, we need tools for framing, for identifying the appropriate unit of analysis and unit of change. And so this also of course takes into account what actors, what stakeholders are invested or of importance and who, who, who's, where's the change going to occur, who is in that field of change, who's in the environment and over what periods of time in multiple times, perhaps it's both polytemporal and equifinal, that is, it could be, there could be many paths to change equifinality to the same outcome. And there could be many approaches to timing. There's also different modes of moving to systemic change. And so the last tool was in step one. This is in step seven of a seven step methodology, the roadmap for transition by design based on Frank Gales's multi-level perspective. And so there are, but there are other types of models that that could be used to represent so i've just indicated some of them here i can save the slides and you can come back to that later the key point from this is there are many different tools and you shouldn't and we need to be careful in tool selection because it can bias our our our, 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 our thinking about the system until we really know what a theory of action is 
I mean, we don't talk enough about theory, a theory of action, which is what actions do we have the capacity to actually take and that we can envision um, forming? That is, what's our theory for the types of interactions and the interventions those actions would take so that we can understand those potential impacts? I mean, a lot of times the theory of change works from impact back to the capacities that we need that can create kind of gaps too. We need to, in terms of moving with the selecting models, we need to know what our capacities are. And then I, I'm starting to work with some like the approaches to mapping where agency occurs in the flow of, of the different levels of change. So from individual, small group to policy, society, culture, and nation, which have different, different focuses on structure and agency. Of course, you have both at each level, but some are more you have more agency at the individual and small group and a culture and that fits social systems theory. And then I'm starting to work with where you might move with those act with access to agency and leverage across those system boundaries. And so a couple points just to, to finalize is that uh, all social change involves some unknowables, uncertainty and complexity. And so change logic models are, should be seen as, really only guidelines for action structures for, for, for uh, enabling a, a right action within complexity. The linear formalisms of the TOC logic models can shape the mental models of, our, of your team and, of, the, and of, the, your, of your sponsors. And so they may create ideal future states, which may not always be a what you would discover in, in, the, in, the, in the field of, of reality itself and may not be able to be guaranteed by planning and action. And so, this, so there's some lo uh, models like process and complexity is probably better if you have higher degree of uncertainty. And another one kind of toward the bottom, last one, next to last on the bottom is remember that implicating the observer any time into the change process changes the change process entirely itself. We change the field by entering it. It's called third phase science, the observer well beyond the observer effect, we are creating the field that we're in, that we are, that we are intervening in. We're not observing. We are totally committed as we enter that, that field. So um, I want to take just a couple quick questions maybe. And so as a, uh, as a breather and to take any questions and then for give um, Ryan, um, um, you know, his half hour. So I just want to, I think I went over a bit. So I'd like to take any questions before we get it that are fresh if um, that you want to ask now. Peter. Hello? Yeah. Hi. Um, while I'm listening to you, I got the image of a sailing ship moving across the ocean. Um, it seems like there are like lots of unconscious flows in a given society or a given situation that that this this these theories and change efforts sit on top of um, and and that might um, either constrain or enable you know, the sailing ships have a variety of mechanisms that allow them to take advantage of the flows they're caught in. Mm -hmm. but, um, the the um, the other thing that made me think about was uh, the um, you know it's like well I don't know basically that's it that was my question the. That's a, good, that's a good question. I mean, could we, I mean, in essence, you're asking about the, the cybernetic nature of, of the metaphor of, of, of sailing. I mean, because sailing is, is where we get cybernetic from. It's the, the, the kybernaut, the, the, the steersman of, uh, of, a, of a boat or of a sailing ship is always making course corrections. They have their eye on a goal, either navigating by star or by location. So they know the direction, they knew the, the generally, they may know the route or they may even just be following a general direction. But while tracking to the course, 
they're making course corrections. They're overshooting, you know, east and then west, and you know, as they're staying on, yeah. well, they're tracking to a course. And that's, um, you know, there there are theorists that would say that would be the appropriate approach to take in in a program of high complexity, in a in a change program of of, of very high complexity where the outcomes will be observed through the interaction. And so this process, this one, the process within complexity is, I think, can, I haven't defined, I mean, any type of complete range of, of theories of change that would be incorporated here. It's more like if a theory of change were created or proposed or visualized, I think this one lends itself to visualization such as this, that, that you could imagine, I mean, one of the, use a lot of metaphors when you create an image like this. So this sketch note resulted in a lot of discussion and even about the meaning of the colors. It, whether the first one was blue and that led to the idea that the bounce was also the flow of, of a river and that it got wider as more people joined it through the flow. And that then leads to really an interesting conversation about whether that in fact is part of the theory of change, that will there be momentum and flow that comes from the force of this bounce of this intervention point that then this kind of river-like flow expands to incorporate more of a movement. And so that's, we use the visualization and the metaphor and then can design to that in a sense by designing meaning, we're actually making choices to represent um, visually and, and theoretic and, um, conceptually in ways that can be communicated and aligned and developed too, that we can actually then develop commitment structures that are associated with those original metaphors. So yeah, by all means, it's visual storytelling is a big part of it. And we have gotten some very good feedback on, on the sketch note as we've been introducing it to some funders because we're able to, anyone can tell a story to this. Anyone on our team can tell their own story to this, but it's better than all of us trying to memorize kind of the pitch, you know what I mean? So that's one of the, rather than like a, an elevator pitch, this is actually how we tell our story. Hey, anybody Thank else? You. Yeah, any other questions you wanna to go to Ryan and I, I can introduce her, right? Uh, is, there's probably one other question. Don't be shy. So. And this is anyone worked with these different approaches or has an argument with like, yeah, I think there's a fifth type and I totally open to a fifth, a fifth sense-making logic. I mean, I haven't, I'm, I'm kind of sorry. There's so much here. There's uh, maybe I'm not sure how to whittle it down yet as it's still kind of new in its presentation, but I think the main part of this is really the four sense-making logic. So I was talking to, you know, um, system change people a lot who are in, in, you know, in social innovation and philanthropy. I could probably boil the first half of this down to two slides and say, here's, here's what we usually think of as theories of change. Here's what I'd like us to, I think this might be more powerful if we move to um, understanding the different logics that we're using and considering the power, you know, what are the most powerful approaches within each of these sense-making logics? Um, Peter, it's uh, Zad here. Maybe maybe a quick quick question and sort of feedback, but sort of also like a pathway to think about is like, uh, while the presentation, because I saw parts of it at RSD as well, it showcases a lot of like your intention with the presentation is to show a snapshot of what current foundations and funders seek out when they have theory of changes based on a logic model. But you know what's, what's interesting and that might even add a level of profoundness to the work that you're working on is fundamentally questioning the premise of why people ought to change. Like what is it characteristically that drives people to change the situations around them? And therefore, like, who are, you know, it's kind of poking at the bear, but like, who are the foundations to say this ought to be changed? And there might be a diplomatic way of doing that by like surfacing the core characteristics of what people perceive, feel, or attitudes towards the nature of change fundamentally. And that might add an interesting mm -hmm. element to your presentation because it would set the premise at the very premise of change. Um, 
I think the Levine work probably gets closest to it as you have. And I think maybe mm -hmm. there's an opportunity there to like even uh, take that to the depth. I think if I actually like populated uh, an iterative inquiry with it with with real content and use that um, for a problem that we were de that 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 a sponsor was was addressing, we could show that the question of change is really also a unit of analysis issue. So the but it's a very good question because it, it gets to kind of Osbekon's um, dilemma. I mean, going back fifty years as to um, you know how do we know that the changes that we seek to make are are going to have you know the right leverage not the most leverage toward envision change but the right leverage to the right outcomes that many stakeholders agree on and also the the embedded assumption that who are we as a foundation sponsor and as a perhaps a, a proposal team who are we to take that responsibility to perhaps change the outcomes in the futures for an entire community or for you know hundreds of thousands or millions of people through technology or through a social intervention or a change in a monetary system. You know, it takes a lot of audacity. It's a it's more than a business like a big hairy audacious business goal. It's we really have to think about the ethics of that level level of impact. And so I think a, a framing tools are what we need. For, for that. And I don't speak about that so much until I got to really saying something about the unit of analysis also being the unit of where change would occur, but also who that who is affected by that change and whether that we've asked them whether they want it. Right. We assume with homelessness and housing affordability and the food supply and all that, that, you know, we're dealing with significant social concerns. Right. But um, the way that even like the sustainable development goals are framed, we didn't have any input into that. And there's this general belief that overall they seem to be good, but we don't know how our programs that are intended to achieve those outcomes are going to affect the societies and those are held in. So it's a, it's a great question, a big question. So why don't I uh, int uh, introduce Ryan uh, Murphy and I'll, I'll stop sharing from here and let uh, Ryan take it. So sure. if you pick it up. And so Ryan Murphy was um, uh, uh, a graduate student, a graduate of the uh, OCAD University Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program. Um, and, uh, and so a few, so after graduating from, um, uh, after graduating from SFI, he, he was uh, one of a few that we get and maybe, maybe we have one a year across the two cohorts who decide that they're going to go on for PhD work. And, and, and sometimes we'll get two in a cohort. And I don't know if there was another one in, across uh, yours, but it's, it's always good to see that the, that the work or the, the kind of acceleration of the ideas that were started um, in, in our program led to kind of bigger and bigger um, intellectual impacts as opposed to a, a lot of our students when, when they graduate will go into you know business or consulting or maybe start a small firm or social innovation but those that go on to, to PhD work and do um, some amazing things and so um, Ryan has been um, collaborating with me actually really since graduation to some extent so we're mm -hmm. co-authors and advise on on some papers but I have to say Truly, Ryan is is the engine of this research and has brought, you know, really something of a research agenda to us with this that I'm happy to participate with. And like he had, he had said early on in his introduction with me is is true that we had both independently arrived at this kind of eureka's around the same time, spring this year, when he was introducing working on a paper that as I was seeing it, you, you, at first with the design management Institute paper, I didn't see the systemic theory of change and that kind of popped in. <laughs> and then at the same time, that was what I had been thinking for RSD. And so this is just mm -hmm. to me, a great collaboration and how things, you know, can occur, can, can work effectively even over distance. So, so, mm -hmm. um, uh, so Ryan Murphy uh, to, to, to you and, and I hope you have, sufficient time to, to to share the whole presentation as you did in RST. So I'm looking forward. Yes. 
Yeah, I think we have a bit more time now. Um, although I still tend to move fast. So hopefully folks poke questions there in the chat. I've been watching it. Um, and uh, we'll have a, a good conversation at the end. Um, <laughs> What were my what were my disclaimers? I always have a few. Well, one is that uh, you all seem to be way too smart. So I don't think that any of the stuff that I'm going to share with you is going to uh, impress you too much. Um, really, what uh, I'm striving to do with a lot of this work is to um, satisfy some of the issues that I've seen come up in the chat, which is like. How do you get uh, a funder who wants to just like act as quickly as possible to really appreciate the systemic nature of the problem they're working with and to slow down? Um, and so one of the this is one of the kinds of hidden objectives of this this kind of work is to try and simplify system stuff without making it without reducing it without losing the the effectiveness of systems work in appreciating complexity and working with complexity and wicked problems so that's a, a tension to hold of course um and it's really yeah it's about i think um just trying to practice that trying to find ways of introducing systems tools to people um, in ways that really resonate with them and let them just sort of run with it. So that was really what got me excited about the theory of change thing is, or about the theory of change um, structure is that it's like, it's clearly a part of a system, right? When you see those those uh, classical, like linear trees that are theories of change, they're, they're a system, they just fail to incorporate any real feedback loops. Um, and so it's like, we're almost there. We just need to work a little harder to get people to appreciate the, the systems nature of this. Um, so I, I'll walk through the slides, as I said, have chat, have a chat in the chat uh, and we will uh, have a conversation. And thanks by the way, for everybody for attending this. It's exciting to, to share and to get some critique. So um, a lot of this outset of this is really um, re restating some of the work that Peter just described, um, just because to make sure we're all on the same page, like this is taking, uh, this work is, is coming from systemic design um, because I see systemic design as a key discipline for addressing complexity um, and for helping us make progress in wicked problems. Um, Conventionally, as we've just heard from Peter, people use theories of change to do this work. Um, unless you come from a systems background, you're used to sort of setting up theories of change and using those. Um, but as we just saw from Peter, um, this is a can be an effective tool for strategizing, but it might introduce problematic levels of reduction. Um, it might not appreciate the complexity of the system sufficiently. Causal loop diagrams and other systems methods um, augment these methods. And that's what we're doing here, is using causal loop diagrams to help drive uh, more complex theories of change and therefore hopefully more powerful more powerful strategies. So we're gonna show how these things can be used together. Um, and one of the, maybe uh, I, I, I really don't like sort of cliches and um, silly metaphors, but it really helps to sometimes, you know, feed people uh, concepts that stick. And so this seed tree forest metaphor that we're going to talk about at the end, um, to me, has resonated quite a bit with a few clients that I've worked with. And so I, I, I like it. Um, so let's, let's skip ahead. Um, uh, and again, a lot of this is repeating what Peter had said. Remember that this was this is the third talk of three that happened us at RSD. Um, but I do want to take a second to highlight um, one of the side points that Peter made, which is that there's a really uh, a growing interest in these kinds of methods from foundations and from funders and from change makers. Um, Peter cited a few, I've seen others. Um, I'm working with two or three clients at the moment who are working on problems who really do appreciate the, the need to take a systemic approach to these kinds of problems that they're working with. Um, and so a lot of the, I saw a lot of comments in the chat about getting people to um, slow down and to um, make sure they're measuring the right things and to, um, you know, have a have an appreciation for how slow and how large scale the change can can be that we're trying to work towards here. And I'm finding that we're seeing more and more groups interested in that kind of work. Um, and so a really quick takeaway for, for some of you, if you're working with a client who um, isn't sure about the sort of bigger, bigger scale versions of the work that you want to do, because they don't have enough time or they don't have enough resources, I would say try to look for these funders and these philanthropists who are taking a, an increased interest in systems approaches. Because um, I think you're going to find more and more groups interested in, um, well, actually not willing to take a reductive approach, not willing to see a theory of change that's like this linear stack of convenient logic um, and to just run with it. I think you're going to see more and more funders and more and more um, decision makers 
able to say, this isn't going to work the way that you've described. So they're going to want to see you come forward with more systemic approaches um, and to appreciate the complexity that we're working with. So uh, the key problem here is that one underlined at the bottom. How do we connect these systems methods that we're used to with some conventional approaches to problem solving that um, the people, the clients, the, the interveners that we're used to working with usually use? Um, and so you've seen lots on theories of change. There was some chatter um, as Peter presented about theories of change versus theories of action. Um, and just to, to put a cap on that, the perspective that I'm taking is that those two tools are complementary. So typically, um, according to program evaluation theory, you are sitting down and acknowledging your assumptions about how the system works. And that's the theory of change. It's like, this is how change happens in this thing that we're trying to measure or trying to impact on. Um, and a theory of action is then based on that theory of change. So you develop a TOC and then you use that TOC to develop an idea of where you're going to act and how that action is going to interact with the system to lead to the change you want. That's the dream. Um, it, TOCs and TOAs have a few key uh, re important takeaways. Uh, and that is these things, these three things here in the middle. They make explicit your understanding of the problem. So they help everybody sort of get on the same page about what we're trying to do. They help you externalize assumptions so you get to write down exactly how you think this is going to work. Gives you a chance to challenge those assumptions, right? Um, and the third is that that bridge of not only how the problem works, but how you think your actions are going to work. Um, and so that's the dream. Um, but of course, they might be overly reductive. Where are the feedback loops? Um, why is it the change just happens in this singular direction and it only takes five levels before you know the world has changed? Um, so how do we try and work with these, these models to ensure that systemic complexity, the, the complexity that's always there, isn't lost in these reductive diagrams? That brings us to my favorite tool in the toolbox, which is causal loop diagrams, um, which capture the structure change in systems. Uh, they are similar to TOCs in that they're uh, like uh, they're they're boxes and arrows, right? We're putting things down the phenomena in boxes, and we're drawing arrows between the phenomena to show how they relate to one another. Um, they don't shy away from complexity, and as a, you're going to see in a second, um, you can you can have quite complex um, um, causal loop diagrams, and still technically they're still functional. Um, and in doing so, you're able to really display the dynamics of a system. And if you take your time, and uh, I'm sure anybody who has worked with CLDs can, has seen this, if you take your time and walk through the system, insights are, are a plenty. Uh, you can really get a sense of how the dynamics of the system work and how um, change will happen over time, as long as you've captured it all. Um, so it's really useful for sort of bringing out that counterintuitive feedback um, that is present in all the systems we're working with and other kinds of structures like archetypes. Um, but they're overly complex. They can be hard to com communicate and hard to use, as I'm sure um, you have found uh, from looking at this diagram right here. You're, you definitely still don't know exactly what this is about or what this is for. Um, so this is, was a diagram created for the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment on how exactly um, they want to change impact investors uh, in order to make sure, or investors to make sure they're investing for, for change. Um, and that's not even that complicated or complex, right? There's like, I don't know, 20 elements and probably about 20 arrows. But this diagram is one that I developed in work with um, a conservation agency who has taken an interest in the fact that we're currently experiencing an increasing number of pandemics and they want to know how conservation can be used to prevent future pandemics. Uh, it turns out that, for instance, deforestation and increasing interfaces between human and wildlife uh, environments increases the probability that we're going to have outbreaks, which is going to lead to more, more um, pandemics in the future. And so um, we worked together and worked with a team of about 30 people from across the world um, to try and understand exactly how human, um, as in economic and, eco and um, social systems, interact with ecological systems. Um, and that's this is the resulting map. But obviously, this is not super useful, right? Uh, I have boiled away the text. You're not supposed to be able to see any text on that just for aesthetic and um, privacy reasons. But even if you had text there, you wouldn't be able to use this. Um, you'd be able to sort of start to trace your, your line or your fingers around the map, but it won't be that useful. Um, and so the question is, if you're going to really try and represent the true complexity of the problem, you need to do work like this. Um, but at the same time, this is not that functional. So we want to use CLDs to appreciate that complexity, but we also want to use theories of change or something similar to design effective strategies. And that's why we're talking about systemic theories of change. 
So the idea here is to use causal loop diagrams and a technique that we call leverage analysis to develop systemically informed theories of change. Right. Um, and it follows a pretty simple process. Was that a question or? No, okay. Um, it, it follows a pretty simple process. Develop a causal loop diagram, make it as complex as you want it, and then identify what you want to change. Like what are the, and this is the measures question that we were talking about in the chat earlier, um, but select the phenomena in that system that you, you want to look different in the future. Um, then you conduct leverage analysis, and I'll talk a little bit about leverage analysis uh, now in a second, um, in order to identify features of the system. So high leverage phenomena, bottlenecks or barriers to change, um, signals, so things that you can easily measure in order to know whether or not the system is moving in the right direction or the wrong direction, um, and some other features. And so developing a theory of change is quite simple. Um, because once you've developed uh, this sense of all these features in the system, you chart a path between these points of intervention, these high leverage or high leverage phenomena, say, and that goal that you've identified. So Peter always already showed you a little bit of this. It's not supposed to be legible; it's just the shape of it that I want you to appreciate. But on the left is a model of Canada's entrepreneurship system, um, and then on the right are two theories of change that have feedback loops that developed from the model on the left. Uh, in the center of that model, that black box is entrepreneurship, obviously the goal that we're, we were working towards in, that, um, in, a, in a systems model to improve entrepreneurship in Canada. Um, the gold um, shaped objects or the gold uh, circled objects are potential leverage points. And then the other little colored flags represent um, uh, barriers and bottlenecks and uh, signals to change or of change. So the point here is that like it's a pretty easy translation um, once you've really broken down the causal loop diagram into these features and then just drawing, you're just drawing maps. You're just drawing these little uh, patterns across these models. Um, so I'll end with this little metaphor um, because again, I think uh, I hate over boiling things down too much, but uh, this metaphor does seem to be compelling. Um, and so the idea here is to use the the concept of seeds, trees, and forests to communicate exactly what we're striving for. So if you have a complex model like this one, um, and you've identified high leverage points, um, opportunities for change, signals, and barriers, the leverage points provide seeds for strategic ideas. Um, so actually, I misspoke. The gold circled ones are not leverage points. It was another color, but it doesn't really matter for the purpose of this little lecture. The point is, you have a sense when you've done leverage points or leverage analysis, you will have a sense of what are potential high leverage elements in the system. So you use those to seed strategic ideas. You say, looking at this particular phenomena, in this case, let's say an efficacy mindset, um, which is the uh, idea that uh, an entrepreneur should be, think that they can try and that failure is okay and so on. So let's say you target that, that's a seed for an idea. So what do you do if you're an intervener looking to change the system on, of entrepreneurship? What do you do to change the efficacy mindset? And then if you look at where that is in the system, does what you, does that possible intervention or do those, do those ideas, those seeds of yours actually fit and help you influence anything else on the, on the map? And that's where trees come from. Um, so after you've chosen, you've chosen one, you start to work outwards to build, build these trees. And a tree becomes this structure. It actually is a systemic theory of change, right? Um, it's this path from an intervention, and now the intervention shows up as these uh, squares that show up here. So say a school-based entrepreneurial incubator, helping students in K-12 or um, parents in K-12 systems think more about entrepreneurship, help their students or help their learners think about how to be an entrepreneur, which hopefully leads to more youth-led uh, startups and so on. So that, that's a tree. Um, and this is just a simple uh, metaphor, again, of taking that seed of an idea and then growing it outward, outwards by looking at how it connects to the other parts of the system. And then the neatest part of this is when you realize that you can connect different theories of change, different systemic theories of change together across the systems map that you've created. And that's the systems, or that's the strategy forest. Um, so here, there's actually two different the systemic theories of change, one focused on school-based entrepreneurship in incubators, and another one focused on adding research requirements to entrepreneurship programs um, in college and university. And these things connect because, for instance, if you can, um, encourage university researchers to, um, to, to have to work with entrepreneurs and so on, then hopefully you'll give them more of an efficacy mindset, say. 
I'm just making this up at this point. Um, but if you if you're able to do that, you see how those two different theories of change actually intersect and might help each other grow. And so therefore you have a strategy forest that you can work with uh, in order to move forward and develop interventions. Um, so this is the wrap up. Um, one of the things that I like the most about these structures is that again, you're using systems methods in the form of conventional tools that the people that aren't used to systems work are able to recognize. So suddenly that theory of change that they are that they're used to actually is a bit more systemic. It's a, it appreciates complexity a bit more than uh, it used to. Um, and at the same time, these models can actually fit with other types of management strategy tools like, uh, for instance, strategy maps. I don't know if you've ever seen a strategy map, but it breaks down the kinds of decisions you have to make um, in a sort of tree structure. So these things align pretty well and um, you, know, you, can, you can use them um, and combine them in some pretty creative ways. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Uh, I know I moved pretty fast, but that was the idea. I can go back to other slides if you'd like. We can switch back to Peter's if you'd like. Um, but yeah, I, I'm interested in what you think. Um, and if you have any critiques or questions, happy to take them. Hi there. Thanks, Ryan. It was interesting. I, I just one quick question. Does the seed, is the seed always the beginning of the journey for a project? It's a great question. Um, actually, I fought with the metaphor. This is what I hate about metaphors, right? It's they, they only start to work in, in a certain way and they don't allow for a lot of flexibility. Um, and when I was first thinking about the right kind of metaphor, I was like, you know, it doesn't need to start as a root, right? It doesn't need to plant itself in the metaphorical ground and then grow deep before it grows tall. You could have a seed that starts right in the middle of a systemic theory of change and helps grow in both directions. So, so really the seed, the idea of a seed is just to inspire people to realize that they're supposed to start somewhere small and grow out from there and branch out from there. Um, so that's the real purpose of the seeds, trees, um, the seeds to trees side of the, the metaphor. Um, but yeah, it was like, I really liked the idea of the quaking aspen um, that is in, I think it's Colorado or something. It's the world's biggest and oldest organism because it's actually a, it's all, actually all one organism, but um, is a built is is some some thousands of trees because it represents more kind of what I'm going for than a single tree or a couple of trees in a coppice. Um, but yeah, a bit like rhizo. I don't know if you heard of the is rhizomic, the rhizomic metaphor. Okay, I've like, heard I've heard it. Tell yeah. us more. So it's when you have like a distributed network of roots and that they, so there's not one tree. And you know? I mean, it's that, it's a bit, so yeah. It, yeah, so it has a flexibility in a way. Yeah, it maybe depends on the, the nature of the setup. Cool. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fungal spores might have been a better metaphor, but uh, it seems a little bit ickier for people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, it's, Ryan, I don't think you uh, you don't need to be uh, ashamed of having a metaphor here, because yeah. we're, like whenever we're dealing with an influence map or a causal loop diagram, it's a many to many thing, right? Like every mm -hmm. every um, element in the map has a relationship with many other elements, and we're just trying mm -hmm. to find strategies to pick which are the smaller number of elements that are the most relevant for a particular question or decision. Right. Totally. And, you know, are yeah. we looking forward to what gets influenced down the line? Are we looking beside? Are we looking backwards? Those are, you know, it's it's just a matter of picking from these big right. maps. Yeah. Yeah. And anything helps anything that helps people who because again, in my experience, we're working with people who are resistant to this, right? Like you show people um, too much and they suddenly back away. Um, so anything that helps people uh, slow down and, and take it one one step by step is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Stephen's been talking in the chat with me and reminding me of the uh, collective sense making that I did on mm -hmm. like a related project. So on my MRP, because if you are with a group of people and you gradually build up the map together, then they've cognitively wrapped their heads around it. Whereas mm -hmm. if they see it, like here's a piece of screen with a hundred bubbles on it, we cannot do it. Yeah. Giving up. Yeah, exactly. 
gravy. It's, it's the spaghetti it's a social construction. Yeah. yeah. You, you construct yeah. it together. Mm -hmm. You're going to hold a common mental model. You're going to understand what you did. It's, it's like the difference between a giga map and a synthesis map that the giga map is only going to be understood by those who worked on it because it's allowed to be so messy, but the, it meaningful and they can act on it. Um, there's the team that developed it and perhaps they don't need to share it with anyone else, but these have to be externalized. If their theories of change, they have to be shared all over the place very often, not just I mean, because the, the funder might need to justify it and they need to speak to it now. So that's why I think they're often simplified. So if you have an approach that they can even speak to the metaphor, now you're helping them with the storytelling. And that's uh, and that, that also lets them reason about it more effectively too. It's more like a synthesis map and that others can also see it, read it, who are people that aren't part of the of the of the design team and mm -hmm. the sponsor team can also understand it externally they can make sense of it and that's where i hope we can do more with the visual representations to empower um, better um, theories of change that actually because they're better because they're represented better uh, more effectively for people that weren't part of you know the the change program Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the big limiting factor, like you, you've two, got two limiting factors. One is what can you graphically show on a page? And the other is how much time do people have to build the strategy together as in, in that collective uh, social construction effort. And mm -hmm. like when you're working with nonprofit people, time is extremely limited. So that's, yeah. I guess that means everybody then, because it's certainly in the in the entrepreneurial or startup world, it's going to, they're going to just, they're, they're going to slash and burn. And so you could, I could actually see that Ryan's metaphor might be, you know, what's the seed. <laughs> mm -hmm. now, let's see a few trees and then our forest is, you know, and they could, but where that could actually be effective is even if they slash and burn it down to, which, um, what's that metaphor? Is that from, um, would that be that isn't exactly what you're doing with controlled burn and forestry because that comes to mind too. <laughs> but but could you actually mix the metaphor with another model to have crossing the chasm through building the, the forest or having the forest grow through, through a slash and burn fire break yeah i know yeah i maybe yeah. I haven't figured that one out yet yeah, yeah. well that's the other thing is could the forest actually then be a, an ecological change? So if you looked at like the MLP, you're actually using, you know, niche to regime to landscape. And that's very often thought of as scaling, but it ought to be thought of instead as ecological change, which isn't a, a scale. The original elements stay the same in an ecological change. The original ecology has been transformed and it might not be, the original, a lot of the species may have, may have, can, you know, may have been tran um, replaced, transposed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I will, I will add one thing on that note, which is, um, Peter, you joked that maybe if you don't have a lot of time, you should just have one seed. But at the same time, one of the things that I dream about with these systems is having a sustained model over time, right? Like, ultimately, mm, say, an institution like a university who wants to understand its, its role, um, in some set of objectives. The, the system that it's operating in changes over time, but it doesn't change drastically. And yet you get these, with theories of change and more conventional strategy tools, you get these like literal, I'm gonna drop this strategy now and I'm gonna go do something different. So you don't get this buildup over time. Um, and that's something I'd really like to see organizations get better at is, um, yeah, I'll move it over his head. Um, this one, something like that. Um, one or two more. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Uh, I can't that remember. One? Yeah, the one before that one. Okay, I'll share the slides too. Um, the one down, one down. Okay. Um, but yeah, so so we we should have organizations. Our, our organizations aren't going away, and they're not changing that drastically over time. So if we have a good systems model of what an organization is doing and what it's working within, we shouldn't have to drop the whole thing. Um, and we should actually be able to see how 
the strategy we had two or three years ago fits with the strategy we want to try now and keep measuring the same things over time um, and keep working on the same sort of or or at least related or aligned initiatives over time so peter joked about the singular seed um, but in reality like i wish we could plant a few seeds maybe we don't nurture some of them we just nurture one grow it up see what it looks like try it out for a little while we still have these other ideas in a model somewhere that we can then return to and, and work with and update over time um and so to some extent that's that's maybe that's the slash and burn analogy it's like if you got to move fast then set all these seeds up grow them as much as possible given wherever the sunlight is um sunlight being the resources and energy you have to work on them and um then slash and burn the ones that don't work Ryan, I have a challenger question. Mm -hmm. How how mm -hmm. um, how can you how how do you rationalize that this approach compared to the current typical ones you see better reflects the real world complexity? Uh, there's a point where you say that the trees take the con take the system's context and conditions into account. Why is that? How is that? Sure, but uh, it's an easy one um, because conventional theories of change are totally linear and like five levels. Um, like because you're trying to make it as as convenient as possible to show it off as one slide in a 15 slide pitch deck for a five minute presentation. So if you build out a systemic theory of change, you by by definition because you're rooting it in this systemic structure, this causal loop diagram, you're going to have. More levels, or at least uh, a different interpretation of what the system's levels might be, um, and you're going to have those feedback loops that are missing in a linear theory of change. You're going to have some sense of how, oh wait, if we go and uh, spend some money on this idea over here, we're going to have less money to spend on that resource over there, which we're going to need, and that's going to cause a fixes that fail problem, right? Um, so yeah, it's this idea that you can start to appreciate the systems archetypes and the system structures and the counterintuitive feedback loops in these models that actually have feedback loops that actually have multiple levels right my my wish for this would lead to a question so ryan actually i have a question because one thing um i haven't used uh tools like toco i don't know if there's another one but the theory of change.org has um a software um program called toco which helps develop a the theory change i assume from the from the picture it's a traditional logic model very very kind of formal structured stuff um a a uh, boxes and arrows and mm -hmm. and and um you're working with um causal loops that could be developed in kubo you could basically also mm -hmm. plug in variable date or you know variable data that is uh, data about specific variables of interest that are represented by the causal loops and you could define those separately and still plug those in to mm -hmm. basically open software like kumo um yeah. is there have you given any thought to like since you you may be working with i mean you're developing the whole cld's but if you were working with your approach if you were working with an organization in advance of the CLD, have you thought of how you might best collect the variables or the you know their their range of values and their inputs to the variables that are used to in a you know that then end up in a Kumu map or a, a theory of change? I mean, <laughs> you collected the right data theoretically, you could map that into the appropriate model. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Just to speak technically for a second, Kumu uh, Kumu accepts an uh, JSON upload so you can link if you have um, data coming through somewhere in real time and you can structure that in a JSON format. Um, you can actually use Kumu to uh, accept the data coming from a variable of some kind, say, I don't know, um, reports from, to use the conservation uh, angle again, reports on forest, def forest defragmentation, or sorry, forest fragmentation in um, some developing countries. You can actually have those numbers show up um, and use Kumu to show how those uh, metrics are changing against some other metric like, um, I don't know, trying to think. You get some policymaker to um, 
note the like strength of current policies on forest fragmentation in another variable somewhere. Um, and so you can start to structure it that way. Um, I don't know, I think you were talking about having it ready in advance before using theories of change. Uh, and I'm sure it's possible. You'd have to be pretty um, clairvoyant in order to be able to do that kind of work, but. Oh, no, I was thinking of sketching it differently, uh, basically capturing oh. it with your team, with your stakeholder team, capturing right. that data in ways that are appropriate, that are consistent with how they think, and then collecting collecting the, you know, that is an input that you can then plug in. Ah, so yeah, totally, definitely can do that. Hmm. Yeah, more of that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you had another question. In the, is that in the yeah, Zad. Uh, Zad was gonna say something. Oh, I was just saying like with your response that the addition of loops helps them see a more systemic effects and the feedbacks. It'd just be interesting to see if, you know, if this is applied, might that help um, I'm, I'm connecting the question that I asked Peter, might that help funders or others realize their inherent problems, in quotes, uh, with their own intervention? You know what I mean? Like they, they, the, the entanglement between themselves and the problem might, might become more uh, easier to surface. Um, so I think that's a, I think we need to consider that in the, I mean, that's almost, you, you know, that's, that, that is a, again, like a framing exercise that we, you know, we need to learn to get better at in the partnership development with our sponsors and to be able to, we're, we're usually so, and I, you, you, you all know this, if you do work with, you know, uh, sponsors who hold the keys to your future successful project essentially that we usually want to tell them a good story and we're we're and it can be difficult to to push you know to for one thing we may not have the time to work with them the sponsors to the extent that would that would further develop or in, intervene in their own in their own models and if we have a successful story that becomes that becomes the garden path i mean we we tend to follow that and work from that so mm -hmm the introduction of more complexity might actually be one of the best ways to move from there. Because when a current model then becomes burdened by too much complexity and they take, then you start to question whether, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's adaptive, it's uh, commensurate with, you know, with the level of change. And then maybe they start to question whether, you know, whether, for example, that, you know, we're, we're taking the best approach um, to, you know, um, I, you know, to economic change, for example, we can't necessarily change a national economy, but we can work with, um, you know, um, five developing areas that represent different types of economies that that we can intervene and uh, work with, develop the appropriate interventions and strengthen, and then see how those work with those. Um, so as the change in thinking, you know, it, change in thinking can come from representing the complexity in a more realistic way or realistic, I guess, more consistent with the, with the numbers of variables and their interaction and representing it in ways that may, may show how difficult um, some of their goals might be to achieve within such a highly complex, because because complexity isn't the problem of just making the right choices. It's that complex systems are so tight, you know, tightly interconnected in ways that that they are going to be resilient and, and reconfigure either in unexpected ways or they're going to recover from your intervention and and, and persist with, you know, a, a variant of, of their original form. I mean, so complex, complicated systems can be kind of unpacked and re, reconfigured going forward complex systems have very, you know, are, are, are too tightly interconnected um, to, to make conventional changes stick. To, to Zad's question about um, helping people realize that they may be part of the problem. Um, I'll, I can let you know in a few uh, weeks or in a couple months, <laughs> one of the projects that have just joined on is uh, uh, exact is experiencing exactly that they've got a bunch of stakeholders and each stakeholder is like well I'm doing this and they're doing that 
So like, why, why aren't they just on my, on the right page? Why don't they, why don't they catch up with us? Um, and that's just like every single person in the system is doing that exact same thing. Um, so we're going to be working with these kinds of methods and hopefully they will be able to um, uh, be able, yeah, be able to see that, be able to see that like, oh, wait, when I do this and we're trying to achieve that, I'm actually in the way. <laughs> so who knows, but uh, hopefully introducing a bit more of the the realities, as Peter has said, the complexities of the system um, will help them see themselves. In um, instead of a funhouse mirror that makes them look good, they'll look uh, real. <laughs> okay, I think I think we're pretty well at time, and trying to respect that uh, Peter uh, that um, uh, Ryan has a has a other family priorities. I think that we'll wrap up for today. Uh, we'll make the recording available. It's in backlog now, number three in backlog. Uh, there will not be a Systems Thinking Ontario event in December. Uh, we do have one in January scheduled for the second Monday, as we always have, but we don't know what the content is yet. And so that'll be some open discussion over the next little while. So uh, thank everyone for attending. This is actually one of the, one of the uh, more popular events that we've had. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone. Thanks. Thank you, David. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Thank Thanks. you. Take care, Ryan, and good luck. Talk talk to you soon. I guess we have some uh, RSD papers to do, and and, and David, Indeed. we can get you the. I can get you the PDF of.